Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Jason Park with the Hypertube Podcast. I'm here with writer, director, producer, Michael Butt. How are you doing, player? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, uh, how are you? I am doing good. Thank you very much. Where are you from, man? I'm from uh, Wisconsin, actually, uh, kind of near the Minnesota border uh, up north. So, okay. Uh, I, I tell you exactly the town, but you'd never find it. Oh, yeah. No, no. You, you don't got to do all that because, you know, we don't want no one geolocating you like, oh, he's in Wisconsin. I know the longitude and latitude. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this, man. How did you get started in, in, in making projects and making films and writing, directing? Like, like take me to the beginning. If you, if you go to the very beginning, it was in high school. And uh, I actually got on to stage acting back then, which a lot of people do. And I was really addicted to the old John Candy and uh, uh, Chris Farley comedies from the 90s. Mm -hmm. And that's who I really wanted to be when I was growing up. I really wanted to be one of those guys. Well, in uh, college, I got really addicted to 1950s B movies, you know, the giant bug movies, the vampire movies, the stuff like that, right? Some of the best movies. And I watched. <clears throat> Yeah, I watched this film called uh, Planet Terror by Robert Rodriguez. I don't know if you've heard of it, but that one just was like, I was watching it and I was like, hey, I could make one of these. And I noticed that, you know, Hollywood doesn't really make many of those anymore. So I started, uh, that's the kind of films I wanted to be in besides the those 90s style comedies, which they also don't make anymore. But uh, those are a little more expensive to make because you need a star and this that and the other thing so i started making these new age b movies to fill in that void and uh it's been going pretty good i got uh this will be my eighth one and uh it all started with uh i made one called yetis which is was has been rated one called one of the best sasquatch films ever made Woo! and then i made vampire motor space okay so Take me to the first film. First of all, I want to say congratulations on making eight films. It is for any indie filmmaker, you know, it's it's almost impossible to make the first one. And then the, for the majority that make the first one, they never make a second one. So for you to make eight projects, I just want to say congratulations. That is a milestone that we all uh, strive to reach. Uh, talk to me about where were you uh, before you started your first project? And then how did that first project come to be? <clears throat> oh, uh, well, technically the first project was uh, one called My Neighbor is Dating a Serial Killer. <laughs> and that was a comedy. And I made it while this, I, I was cast as the serial killer in this other guy's motion picture. And I was, I was reading through the script at the beginning and I was like, you know, if we just do... If I can, if I can just direct one silly take, I can make a comedy out of this. And the guy was like, yeah, sure. Go ahead. So I, we, we'd set it up. We do this like five or six of the serious takes. And then we do one where we overacted and I edited all those together and made my neighbors dating a serial killer. And that one didn't go anywhere. It's on YouTube, but it's, it's really bad because I had to just the it, the equipment was nothing because I, I he wouldn't let me use his equipment i had to use mine the first the first so uh, i always say it's it's a, it's two things right and, and you can probably agree to this it's film school and it's a confidence builder because once you complete that first film you're like oh i can do it i can do it again <laughs> uh I, I actually didn't go to film school the only film schooling i got was by watching the old movies and of course the dvd uh the dvd commentaries of of old movies no, which I'm saying, I'm the saying, young kids I'm don't saying, understand you, today you doing but... the first film is your film school you learn so much from me oh that absolutely film. absolutely like uh th th that's what i did instead of spending the money on going to film school i just made films and uh I, I, I just casted people I knew, friends. Uh, I put, there, there used to be something called Samaritan Casting. They used to be able to get actors for to do it for free. And you can find uh, 
uh, on Facebook and there's like a couple groups, like there's a one called actors in Wisconsin. That's how I used to get people to do it. But now that I'm, I'm famous enough, I actually have people come to me and go, Hey, I want to be in one of your movies. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll, I'll, and then sometimes it works out great. And sometimes they, they like keep canceling and rescheduling. It's just like, Ur. but I, it's just a, it's a real big honor when someone comes up, especially when they actually follow through, it's just like, it's the best it's, euphoric. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, okay. So you made that first film, you learned your lessons and you know, with every project, you become better as a writer, you become better as a filmmaker, you learn where you made your mistakes and you're able to improve. So, from your first film, how did you get to your second film? Well, my second film, uh, my first film was I, I did that just in while I was still in college. And uh, then I wrote a fake trailer to try to get funding for Vampire Ticks from Outer Space. That didn't work out too good because I, I actually went to college for journalism and uh, theater. That's where I learned directing. So technically I did go to school, just not for film, just it was for acting, directing, and journalism. And those two things kind of coincided into film. And I decided I was going to make, because I had uh, my, my parents were going to burn down my childhood home because it was just falling down and we, they, they, they just, uh, my mom still lives on the property, but, uh, that, that house was going to be burned down. And I was like, well, I want to immortalize this house in a movie. So I made, uh, Yetis using that house. Cause I knew if I destroyed it, it's not a big deal. It was going to be, it was and, destroyed anyways. Right. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the the last scene in the movie, you can actually watch the house burning down, which was really cool to be able to stick that in there. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, unfortunately, the, the, it was burned down during the day and the scene happens at night. Uh -huh. So I had to do an extreme close up of the building, yeah. but you'll never know. I mean, if you really think about it from a from an indie filmmaker standpoint, having that house burned down like that, that production value is crazy. It's like, who gets a house? I know, right? <laughs> that is the secret, okay? You got to write for what you have. You don't get things for your vision. You take your vision for the things you have. And that is how you can create eight motion pictures. Because you'll, you'll, you'll make one motion picture with what you have. And then you take that little bit of funding that you get for selling that motion picture. And then you make some puppets for vampire ticks from outer space and you use your your uh home your your your, uh, your parents home for that one too actually and uh then you take the money from that one and uh you use that to make your next one so okay and you just you just keep going like that but you do need to have a regular day job unfortunately you can't just uh work on on uh, your own projects because the money is always really tight. That's that's but the secret. If, the you, if you keep it, if you keep your your uh, yeah, the day job is really a secret. Finding finding one that you can that you can stand that you like doing, or at least you know don't hate doing, and that gives you time. That is a huge asset. If if you can find a day job that gives you time to work on your art, you got it. That is. That is the no, that is the number one hardest thing besides distribution. Distribution has gotten very, very hard lately. It used to be so easy. We're touch on distribution later, but okay. So so okay, so yeah. so walk me into okay, so your second film now, now you're now you're using that momentum from one, film one, film two, and now you're going into film number three. What was film number three like? Uh that one was The Man with the Golden Hand. And that one I did uh it was inspired a lot by an old episode of the outer limits called the demon with the glass hand. Mm -hmm. I have a guy travel back in time, like in that one, only instead of the sixties, it was to the 2010s. Cause that's when I was, was filming it. And 
he came from the I, was it the year 2086 i think it was and in that time line uh the world has been taken over by one gigantic corporation and so i had to create these uh i didn't have to create much but i just had to create enough so that you could see that these people were coming from a different world into our own mm -hmm. and i used a lot of cheesy 60s techniques which were really cheap i used uh i, I colored uh neko wafers black and so when they snapped them it was they get shot back in time so they looked like a coin that was breaking but it was really just a neko wafer so you got to be frugal with that stuff uh and i actually hired some actors and that was the only one that i had a designated cameraman for besides that it was usually just me but i actually had uh, one of the actors uh was i went to college with him and he actually did study film so it was like hey man can you can you take care of this camera for me for a while and sure enough he did and so that's why a couple of the shots are actually uh a little more a little less uh antiquated and a little more modern because I, I like the classic style, so I I use that, and I I like to use a lot of uh, close-ups to, like when someone's stabbing someone, I'll I'll just take a a piece of cloth that looks like their their jean jacket, so I'll take a piece of of denim from a pair of pants, and I'll I'll put a, a blood pack underneath it, and I'll stab it with a screwdriver, something simple like that, and it, it's really effective. So how was it, you know, Sorry. working with your other projects, you're the cameraman, and now for this film, you have a designated cameraman. What was that like? Because most most indie filmmakers, they don't have a designated someone else. It's them, right? They're wearing many hats. So what yeah. was that like? That was really cool. <laughs> it was my friend Daryl Davey was awesome, and I've been trying to get him back on a set for a while now, but he's got... Uh, a family and responsibilities and he moved far away. So we'll hope that uh, not this one, but the next one, I actually am, I've got some, some plans to go out and get some backers for the first time. Cause I've always, I've always funded it myself, except for like the advertising. I'll, I'll go out and I'll get local businesses to sponsor ads and stuff like that. Sure. So that they, you know, just piggybacking, and I got that idea from the. I went to a garage sale and I saw a movie poster for uh, *Romancing the Stone*, and they were breaking through a Budweiser poster in it. And I went, "Well, if they can pair with Budweiser, why can't I pair with local?" Uh, yeah. So I, right now, uh, I'm, I'm still kind of looking around, but I have a, a small deal with uh, oh, Vintage Vinyl, I think it is. Shoot, yeah, it's Vintage vintage Vinyl. Let me just look it up real quick. It is uh, something about records. Limbo Records. Mm, limbo. limbo Records out of... Yeah, they they're uh, a small place out of Prescott, and they got two stores. Press, oh uh, no, not is it Prescott? No, it's not Prescott. Shoot, Maiden Rock, Maiden Rock, and uh, Ellsworth. They got two stores, and and they actually were like, "Hey, dude, I want to sponsor your your next movie. Here's some money." And I was like, "Uh, I don't know when I'll be able to do that, but okay." So that was a huge honor to have them on, on board. Now I can't even see you. Sorry. It's going okay. back to you. So, there we go. So then you move from, so from project three, you, uh, what was it? Okay. Now, so now we're on project four. What was project four like? Project four. Oh, that one. You got some good stories on this was, uh, <laughs> Well, Okay. So that one, that one, I, it was kind of like, it was my answer to the fact that they were redoing the Evil Dead. 
or that they had redone the Evil Dead, and I hadn't seen it at the time. But I was like, you know, you can't redo the Evil Dead. You're going to screw it up like all the other remakes you're going to make. Right, I said right. to myself. So I wrote this film that was like the Evil Dead. It had all the, the fun of the Evil Dead, but it was a completely different storyline. It did have an evil book, but it had very little uh, to do with anything in the movie. It just was a creepy, leather-bound, evil book that uh, it turned out to look a lot like the one in the, the new Evil Dead, because I actually watched that, and I, I enjoyed it. It was actually one of the better remakes out there. Still not still not as good as the original, no, by, not by a far shot, but I, I angrily wrote that book, or uh, This Woods is Cursed, to have that same feel and try to bring back that fun from the 80s uh, I kind of moved out of the 50s and 60s and into the 80s with that one while keeping everything in today's uh, mindset, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the, the stylistic choices I made were very 80s. And my first draft, I had written it with a whole bunch of 80s slang in it. And uh, some of the actors were like, this is dumb. And so then I, I would, we did like one scene and I was like, all right, fine. I'm going to rewrite it, everybody. It's going to be okay. So I had to rewrite it that last, <laughs> the next day. And uh, it turned out really well after that. Uh, so what would you say? I had to. No, I was going to say, so what would you say? Like, you know, as a director, you're working with these actors, they're giving you feedback. How do you handle that? Like, you know, uh, like essentially, I guess what I'm asking is like, how do you work with actors? Like, like what's your kind of game plan? What's your, your process? You have to remember when you're working with actors that you're working with other creative people and they all have their own thoughts and ideas. And what you have to do is uh, you have to take what you can from them to make your show better and you have to allow them the illusion that they are in control because sometimes they basically are like uh, in the movie Ace Ventura uh, Jim Carrey overrode everything and just made his character what he it was, and it wasn't supposed to be that way. I, if I remember right, I, I think that was the movie he did where he did that. But uh, sometimes you have to just, you have to let them go. Sometimes you have to rein them in. Sometimes you have to stop them, but that's a dangerous thing. If you ever stop an actor, sometimes it'll be hurt feelings. So try not to do that. Even if you have to do it like, you know, hey, let's try it this way, and then we'll try it your way. And you you may waste a take, or you might find out in the editing room, hey, that take that he did right there, that 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 thing saved this film because later on we we forgot to grab this shot of him over here, and we just happen to have a three second clip of him going that we can shove in right right there and fix it in post. Right. So you you got to use what you have. Yeah, so it, but, uh, it's interesting. It's very, you know, it's a very, it's a good point that you brought up because it's a very fine line because as as artists, right, in every single portion of making a movie, whether it's props, writer, director, producer, makeup, they're all creatives, they're all artists. And anytime you say, nah, we're not going to do that, right? Or, or you shun down the idea that essentially you're almost attacking the soul a little bit. Right, like as, as a yeah, creator, and it hurts. Well, you, you got to remember, they have an image of what the show is like in their head, and it's not your image. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, who's the guy from Jaws? He thought that that movie is going to be absolutely terrible because his mm -hmm. vision was not Steven Spielberg's, and Steven Spielberg actually had to was in the uh, editing booth fixing it up. And uh, was it Richard Dreyfus? He was he was like, oh, I did, 
I don't think this movie's going to be a very good. It's, you know, he was talking bad about it. And then Jaws comes out and he sees that it's this entirely different thing than what he expected. I mean, he was there right. on set. He was, he was, he was making it with Spielberg, but his eye didn't see it the same. And, and that's something that a director, especially an independent director has to remember is other people's eyes on the project are going to be different. And not only that, but your eye might have to change as well. Because sometimes it, the movie doesn't get made or cement, set in cement until the editing room. Hmm. All right? Like, if you stick so rigid to your original thought, you will never get it done. Because everyone contributes. And, you know, what, what I've noticed, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when you're making projects... It's almost like what you envisioned when you're writing and then what's delivered uh, in post when the project is done, it's edited, sound design, all this stuff. It's a lot of times so different. It's so different than with the imagination you had when writing. <laughs> yeah, that is so true. That doesn't mean it's worse. It's usually better, actually. But So, okay, so... So you, you you have these films. Let's 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 actually skip a little bit and then let's dive into this upcoming film that you have. Talk about that project. <clears throat> that project is called With the Droll, and it is kind of a dystopian film, but it's right on the very beginning of a dystopia. It takes a lot of what's happening in our world today and then just cranks it up just a little bit more. Like, I don't know if you've heard about the uh, Trank epidemics on the East and West Coast. And uh, just there's just so many drugs out there right now. And if you turn on your television, what do you see? Yeah. Drug commercials. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Everyone's trying to tell, take this. And then if you have bad things, take that and you take the other thing as well. So I created this fake drug called Rejunapril. And what Rejunapril does is it boosts your body's ability to do everything. So your immune system is boosted. You, you're not tired anymore. Everything just is better when you take Rejunapril. But the problem is Rejunapril was rushed out to market because it's so good, right? Right. Like what? When haven't we heard of that happening right. in the it's drug industry? Am I, am I right? <laughs> so uh, they find out that withdrawal starts having some bad, or excuse me, rejunapril starts having some bad withdrawal symptoms, and they they drink it from the market. Right. You know the. The, the, I can't tell you what it is. It's, I'm just going to use they because I don't want to get in trouble with any official agencies. I should just use, you know, it's just recalled from the market. And people start getting tense and, you know, all their pains come back and they start getting irritable. And just like two days after it's yanked off the market, people start going insane and start getting violent. Well, while this is happening... Uh, an ex hippie named Pete, he, he, uh, goes to, uh, he gets kicked out of his apartment by his old lady and he goes to reconnect with his stepson Boyd for Thanksgiving. So he has a place to stay. The stepson Boyd though, is he's like a survivalist, but he's not because he doesn't have a lot of money because he works at a place called hot dogs. <laughs> and uh, so he doesn't, he doesn't want to take care of Pete because he tried that already and it didn't work out. And he, it, uh, he, Pete actually stole from him. So he kicks Pete out. World starts going crazy. Uh, Boyd packs up his gear and bugs out gets out to the middle of the forest to wait for everything to calm down. Well, Pete's been sleeping in his car, so he goes along for the ride as well. Then it turns into a kind of odd couple scenario where the two are trying to, to uh, not kill each other while the world's going crazy 
uh, uh, back back in the cities. And I'm not going to spoil it too much, but there's a lot of comedy, there's a lot of meaning, and there's even some uh, there's even some cautionary stuff that I'm I'm trying to get through. What uh, to, uh, for this one? What uh, like what camera did you guys use, and what lenses did you guys use for the latest project? I used uh, the latest one. It's a gigantic one from Pakistan Panasonic and it's it's a really good camera but it it only cost like two thousand dollars no it cost me about almost three thousand dollars when I bought it but now it's worth about two thousand dollars because uh there, there's better technology now uh I want to say it's like HM13 something something mm -hmm. but don't quote me on that I don't have it in front of me but it's this huge thing, like this big. And I, I literally would walk places while I was carrying this for my uh, sh show, Wisconsin Unexplained, and people thought I was with the news because it's so huge. They think it's... Uh, you choose that camera. Uh, you know, if you think about it, within like the twenty five to $3,000 price range, you have so many camera choices. The microphone. Oh. The one uh, I I love using onboard mics because then there's less problem or chance of problems going on. I know they're not the greatest microphones ever. I have uh, lots. Of, I have some filmmaking friends who are. Uh, they always say to me, "Hey, why don't you record audio in a studio after you shoot it?" Well, then I have to get the actors back after it's all edited and have them redo their lines and i just it's it's hard enough to get actors to stick through the whole shoot so i like to record audio day one and if i don't have a a guy with a boom mic which i never do or i've done once i was the guy with the boom mic uh then uh, you gotta go with the onboard uh microphone so this one actually only does 1080p, but that is as good as the human eye can see, supposedly anyway. If you talk to an optometrist, 1080p is enough for the human eye, which means you can't really cut down the image right, much, right. but, but uh, you can upgrade it to 4K and nobody but some really, really weird guy who's going to zoom up to the cam to the TV is going to notice because that's all the eye can see. Right. Nobody. And nobody uh, so it's pixel peeping. Nobody does that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like, Oh, let, let's watch the, the good, the bad and the ugly in 4k so we can see the film grain clearer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 funny. I have a uh, like a Blu-ray collection of like movies that I've enjoyed throughout my life, and then I, I'll buy the Blu-ray and stuff. And Blu-rays all 1080p, and anytime they come out with like the 4K scan or the 8K, whatever it is, I'm like, yeah, there's no need for me to upgrade. I mean, just because you see it a little sharper or a little clearer doesn't make the movie any better or any worse. That's yeah. I mean. Uh, the Blair Witch Project, I think, was meant to be watched on VHS. I really do. It's just the, the the bad quality just adds to it, I think. Well, yeah, because you feel like you're watching something you're not you feel like you're watching. Exactly. That's kind of what it feels like. Okay. So you got eight projects. You got but yeah, for Go ahead. Sorry, but I just want to stress this again for any filmmakers watching this. Good microphones all right a lot of people say you know you got to get this that and the other kind of microphones no just an onboard mic is enough but make sure it's the best possible one you can afford because it's really sound is so important so does that and does that panic wear your headphones how does that um does it record like 32 float 24 bit like what was so special about this particular onboard mic Boy, I wish I knew. You just like the way it sounds. You're like, it sounds good. We're rocking. I just, I just, I just watched YouTube videos on it and went, well, that's, 
That's about as good as I can see, and it sounds really good. We're gonna go with that. Okay, awesome. And then for this latest project- To tell the truth. Go ahead. No, I said to tell the truth, as in, that's what I was, oh, oh, I was okay. saying was the <laughs> truth. Was... Uh, so for this latest project, you did all the camera work and everything. You didn't have a separate camera guy like you did before. No, I mean, sometimes I'll have the, an actor jump on it for a second, you know, to- Sure to uh but what are what are you know but, yeah this one was just mostly me for the indie guys out there like what's you know they're starting their first project whether it's a feature film a short film anything like what's the lessons that you've learned throughout the eight films that you could like that you could pass on to new upcoming filmmakers that would save them a lot of headache and trouble you don't it's a good idea to have everyone in the same scene when you're shooting, but you don't have to, all right? Like, if you've got a really good, this shot in this building over here, you shoot that with their actors talking to an extra who's doing the lines over here, but you cut out those lines and you put in uh, some other, some slightly famous actor that you can get for cheap or free like i'll get joel thingvall who's a, a good friend of mine or mike cook uh but their their schedules are always so busy it's hard to schedule them with everyone else and also i'm i'm filming really fast so i can get everybody done and out so i'll have one of these guys uh who's i don't know mike cook is uh is a guy who does a lot of mim verse movies i don't know if you know christopher mim but uh, I had him for one movie, and so I filmed all of his part by himself. And then I filmed the characters who interact with him. They throw the knife, and then like on a completely different day, I have the knife stick into him, and he dies on his couch. And then I film the rest of that scene with them interacting with each other as if the guy has fallen behind the couch so you can see his legs, but you can't see the rest of them. But he doesn't actually have to be there. Right, okay. So I guess so one, one of the big advices you're saying is, hey, you don't have to have everyone there at once. You can shoot it in sections and still get the cohesiveness that you need. Yes, don't be clever. <laughs> be clever, that's the number one thing. Uh, if don't be afraid to try something that might not work out and uh a, a film that's done and acceptable or you know watchable is better than a perfect film that's not done mm, mm. say that again say it again for the audience a film that is done uh, and acceptable yes sir is better than a perfect film that is not done. I, I could not agree more. Um, you know, waiting for the perfect opportunity for the perfect schedule with the perfect lighting for the perfect cast with the perfect budget. Um, it may come in 10, 20 years, who knows, but to wait on that and miss out that opportunity to go create something right now, I think holds a lot of filmmakers back because they're waiting for the perfect storm. And for the most of us, the perfect storm just doesn't come. No, it doesn't. I mean, it, you, you have to, you have to find a balance between this is watchable and this is perfect. And if you can find that balance, you will find an audience and you might not find a way to distribute to that audience easily. Uh, I always have problems with file formatting and stuff like that. So I, uh, I got in trouble with the film hub recently. They, they won't let uh, cosmic blast on there because it would be like, Oh no, you didn't have the right file thing. Oh no, you didn't do this. Oh no, you didn't do that. Well, you tried too many times, so you can't do it. And it's just like, why, uh, you, I, I changed every single time you told me to change. Why am I being barred? What, what can you do? What's the, you know, 
what's the the best performing movie uh that you have in your catalog right now what film is that and like what's the genre of that film uh it was this woods is cursed and that's a a horror film that's the one that's like the evil dead but not okay that was the number one uh film i had for the longest time but right now it's actually Wisconsin Unexplained, which is actually a TV series that uh, I did about Wisconsin things. Like, I would do research and I would find people to talk to and they would tell me things that happened to them that were unexplainable. I, I got a UFO one. I have the Devil's Punch Bowl, which had gnomes and spirit things happening in it. I had uh, The Haunting of Mount Watson, which was ghosts. And unfortunately, I didn't interview anyone who saw them personally on that one, but I interviewed the caretaker. And he told all these stories about all these people who were he was working with who would see things, and he never got to saw, see any of them. But he, you could tell in his face that he wasn't joking. Like, so horror, he would, he'd, horror, we'd horror talk about... Horror, mystery, that kind of thing is, has been your best performance. Uh, Horror is probably the easiest one to distribute because uh -huh. if it's bad. Yeah, because if, if it's bad, there'll still be there's if it's bad but good, there's still gonna be an audience. Whereas if you try to do a romance and the quality is bad, it might just turn people completely off. But horror fans are much more forgiving, especially horror comedy fans. Okay, so okay, you, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. So within that that horror genre, if the quality isn't up to par, they'll forgive it, right? It, they they like the whole spectrum of horror. Yeah. It could be found footage, it could be shot on a VHS tape, it could be you know shot super cinematically or not, and they'll watch all of it. They just want to enjoy themselves and be scared, or just laugh. Yeah. Okay, so you could almost have a parody comedy, and that could still do well. Yes, that's something I want to uh, to tell everybody right now, all the, all of you filmmakers out there. If you're going to do a horror comedy, don't do a a parody that knows it's a parody. I mean, it can know that it's a parody, but it has to pretend that it doesn't know that it's a parody. If that makes sense, mm. you have to play it serious the film has to take itself serious break the fourth wall or else the audience won't laugh uh, you can break the fourth wall but don't do it all the time like if you just have once or twice that the the character just <laughs> can you believe that yeah yeah but you can't do that all the time it has to be special so let's let okay. You're so, not making Deadpool here, right? Right. And and by the way, Deadpool uh, versus Wolverine or Deadpool and Wolverine was absolutely incredible. I loved every single second of it. I have to see it yet. I haven't seen it I'm yet. I'm not going to tell you anything about it. So, but I I personally I loved every second of it. So let's talk about distribution then. So you have these eight projects. You have these films. You have an upcoming project. What has distribution been like? You said earlier it was easier and now it's difficult. Walk us through when it was easier and what that was like and then how it is now being more difficult. So, in the time before time, once upon a time, Amazon would take pretty much anything. All right? You just had to make captions. You did, for a short time, you didn't even have to make captions. You just have to submit it and someone would look at it, make sure it's not pornography and they'd stick it on. And so I'm making like 500 bucks a month on, on this woods is cursed alone. And I'm, I'm rocking out on, on those days. I miss those so much. And then just before, uh, uh, COVID, I, I well, they were really pushing the originals at the time, so I kind of think that they were maybe pu puffing up their originals by getting rid of a bunch of indie content. Mm -hmm. Don't don't quote me on that. That's just what my think is. 
Uh, but everyone, every, all of my fi- friends who were filmmakers were going, I got kicked off of Amazon. I got kicked off of Amazon. They won't let them stream with Prime anymore. And it's like, well, why are they doing that? Right. And I was the second to the last of my friend group to get kicked off. It was me, and then it was Christopher Mim, who does the black and white ones. And the last one of mine to get kicked off was uh, Vampire Ticks from Outer Space. Mm. So I kind of wonder if they weren't thinking uh, that that one was a 1950s movie or something like that. I don't know. But uh, and they, his look like 1950s movies, but and you can still buy them, at least most of them on Amazon. But they they kick them completely off, and then you'd have to resubmit them mm. because they didn't want them on on uh, Prime anymore. In fact, you could only you can only get uh, the first episode of Wisconsin Unexplained for free on Amazon right now. The rest you have to pay for. So. I, I'm very lucky. I actually have people who are like, "Yeah, I want to see the rest of them. Let's let's pay for them." But I, I'd rather, I'd much rather have them up there on up the, up there, all of them up there for free, and just give me half of whatever ad revenues you can get for them. Right? right. That would make me so much happier. Uh, what? Makes- and there was a big. Sorry, I'm I'm still going here. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. There was a big time when uh, there was nothing. There was just nothing for independence. And then all of a sudden, all these little independent uh, distributors popped up. And so I jumped on a bunch of them. Uh, Scareplex. Scareplex was my number one favorite uh, of these guys. And they still do a horror magazine called Horror Fix. Horror-Fix, which I think is... Uh, kind of funny because my company's more dash on, but uh, they had the Scareplex and I had all my stuff on there and my stuff was performing absolutely terrific, but uh, it was, well, okay, maybe not absolutely terrific, but considering oh, good, it was good. Uh, what independence was, it was doing, it was doing better than, than, than uh, you'd expect. But uh, since there's just, there's so many independent uh, companies out there just streaming stuff on YouTube and stuff like that, that uh, they had to go out of business. So I'm still on push play, which is a push play dot VIP, which I think is a little odd uh, that they would go dot VIP instead of dot com. But uh, they're still running my stuff, and that's the place you can find Cosmic Blast right now because uh, uh, that that's that that one's uh, doing pretty well on there. Uh, besides that, it's all Film Hub now, and Film Hub was easier uh, at first. Uh, what it was really hard because you had to have, have everything right. I it's just hard to get all it's like they change file formats that they want or something i don't i don't exa- exactly know what's going on and i've never been a good speller so my captions will sometimes have the wrong word or have uh, the wrong spelling of a word and so then they'll get kicked back and now they don't let you continue you know fix whatever it was and try again because if you do that too many times, you're done. Right. Go I on. use um, can't get on it anymore. I think it's called Rev R E V. I don't know if it's Rev.com, but Rev Captions. That's what I use to caption my films. I used to use do it manually through YouTube, and I would go in manually just caption the entire project. But now I just use Rev, and it's about like a hundred bucks, hundred twenty bucks for the entire film. <sighs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Something to think about. Maybe I'll look into that. Yeah, I've, I've been, I, I, there's a, there was a free program. I think it was called subtitle edit mm-hmm. that I would just download onto my computer and then I would do them from there. So, so I'll think about Yeah, no, it, that though. You know what it is? It just takes the, as an indie filmmaker, you tend to wear a lot of hats and you tend to have to do a lot of manual work. Um, they're not a sponsor or anything. I, 
it's just that's just what I ended up using because I realized um, when I was doing subtitles for I made a film called Four Amigos and then I, I made a director's cut of it called Fast Atlanta and I put that on YouTube um, that when I was doing the subtitles for you know Chinese subtitles Spanish English all this stuff I was like golly this is this is just tiring at some point even when you finish the initial subtitle um and then you have to translate it and go to google translate and all this stuff i was like god this is this is just monotonous so then i started googling and started researching yeah. you know and then that's where i found rev and i was like you know what i can eat a hundred dollars to take away my pain of having to do this <clears throat> yeah that's something about me i gotta stop being so cheap and actually like hire people to do things uh on this next uh i'm not sure exactly what my next project will be but i'm going to be uh trying to find people to actually invest in my next one like instead of having a budget of five thousand dollars let's say like my other films that's like the top i've ever used to make a film i might i might actually go all the way to like 70,000, 60,000, something like that, if I can find the right backers. Sure. Uh, and it's just going to be hard to convince them that, hey, I'm going to take your products that you have, put them in the film, and not only am I going to do that, all the advertising that I'm going to be putting into this film, I'm going to be putting your products on that advertising. So if I can, if I can convince them to give me a shot with their products, I will, you know, I'm, I'm also going to look into the products and go, is this something that's actually good or is this something I don't want to be associated with? I want to make sure that they're good products. But if I can get enough products for enough capital to actually make something that's not just a no budget, low budget, horror movie and actually something that's competitive uh i'm hoping that i can bump more on productions and into the new new line cinema have, i don't know if you know what new line is no are we talking about like new line cinema the the logo that's like this i i know that distribution company right the, the new new line cinema you know they made uh, the ninja turtles and yes, stuff like yes, that yes I'm, I'm hoping to be able i'm hoping to be able to grow more on productions and actually start making uh, not just low budget, but cinema quality stuff. And then the dream is to hire other filmmakers and then just check on them like Walt Disney did, walking around, poking them, saying, oh, how about we do this? How about we do that? Have you thought that would about, be have the you absolute dream for like, me. Uh, like a Kickstarter or like a seed and spark to raise funds for your next project? Like, hey, Hey, what's up, guys? I've done eight eight films, and they've done this and that. These are the numbers, and I'm you know looking to reach this goal of X amount of dollars for this project. Well, the problem with that is all of my fans are working class people so far. So it's like I'll give you a dollar, and it's like you have given so much. I want you to keep your dollar because yeah. I love you. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I, I love I love my fans incredibly, but I ha I'm I'm gonna want to branch out into a more lucrative fan base, if that makes sense. Sure. Before I do that, so I've, I haven't had any luck with Kickstarter or Patreon or anything like that. I mean, I'll get I'll get a hundred bucks, I'll get you know seventy five something like that, but uh, it's kind of not worth. Poking and then and then the Patreons and stuff like that they'll take a, they'll take a cut of that too so it's like instead of working so hard to advertise this thing right why don't I just go to work and then I'll come home with a paycheck and then Uncle Sam can be happy and I'm not paying these uh crowdfunding bs got it I, I i you know what i mean yeah i see what you're saying so you shoot all your projects in wisconsin in minnesota oh, sorry 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 minnesota what what is that community like i'm in wisconsin and minnesota oh and, okay so both of those in I'm, the I'm, yeah because I'm, I'm close to the border so i, so I just do a giant radius around me 
Okay, that's like being in Georgia yeah. and Alabama or Tennessee. You can kind of just go through all those little areas. So what what's the community yeah. like in Wisconsin and Minnesota? Because these aren't areas that I would say are known for filmmaking. What's that creative atmosphere like? Um, well, Milwaukee has a ton, and I'm not near Milwaukee, but Milwaukee area has a ton of uh, horror hosts and band people and stuff. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, I need to get your your movie. Well, when I started, I was like, hey, can you guys put vampire ticks on your uh, on your playlist so that, uh, you know, I can get some some people to see it. And they were like, you know, what? I'll, I'll I'll take a look at it. And I get the the call back and they go, you know, that was actually good. So, thank you. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so horror hosts uh, are they're down in the Kenosha area. I haven't been able to talk to Sven Gulli at all, but I've talked to people who've talked to Sven Gulli and it's, it, he's I think he's owned by Universal. So I can't get on that one. But all the little the little guys across the United States, uh, most of them have. Uh, picked up my stuff unless we had a personal feud on Facebook. Uh, I've had a couple of, it's like, well, what, why the heck are you feuding with me? What, what's going on? I just posted this thing because whatever. But Facebook that's is, neither here nor there. The Facebook, you know, the, the film, the, the, the filmmaker groups in Facebook is very interesting. You have. Yes. It can be super helpful or it can be super not helpful 100 percent, and i think I, I think the reason for that is because every filmmaker or everybody that works within this space whether you're working on big hollywood projects as a grip you're doing your own thing they all have a philosophy of how things should be done and then if you don't do it the way that they think it should be done you're either a villain then you're an amateur yeah yeah exactly they're like ah oh, yeah don't work with that guy it's it's interesting because you know you have one side of it where you have all these people that, that will give you such useful information, such insightful information. It's like, okay, join the Facebook groups. You can learn and grow there and collaborate with other people. Then on the complete opposite end, you have people that will like look down on you and shun you because you're trying to get the ball rolling. You're, you know, you don't have the resources, but you're trying to, you're trying to fight that fight. And it's like, oh yeah, no, you can't do this. You can't do that. No, don't do that. And I tell the filmmakers out there, don't ever listen to anybody that's telling you how to do something, you have to just figure out your way on how to get it done and then get it done. And then hopefully you grow to being able to be in a position where you can do it better. Yeah, uh, I I can agree with that. But you know, do listen sometimes like, uh, oh, oh, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't go there. The cops will, will arrest you. No, they, they always yeah, are yes. looking. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking, I'm talking more like don't listen to someone stifling you trying to get that engine running and going uh, because not all of us yeah. are going to have a hundred thousand dollar budget or this big budget to do something. Sometimes we just got to do it with sweat equity and just put the work in. Sometimes you get a return. Sometimes you, the return is the experience itself. Exactly. Exactly. So if you were to, if you were to leave one advice to the aspiring filmmakers what would it be that's different from the advice you gave earlier in the interview what would be that advice like if you were talking to yourself you're you're 18 you're out of high school you're like man i want to go make the terror of worm zombies on planet you know right you you want to make this movie what's the advice that that the experience that you've gathered throughout the years right now would tell that person don't expect money <laughs> elaborate all right there might be some money but do not expect money if you're doing this for money you're doing it for the wrong reasons and why do you say that because it's a lot of work like you could make more money uh roofing a house not gonna lie i agree you're doing agree. this because yeah, you're doing this because you want to make the movie, not because you want to make money. I think it was Disney who said, we make money 
no, we don't make films to make money. We make money to make more films. We don't make films to make money. We make money to make more films. That is beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Because the whole goal as a filmmaker, right? It's really two things. Hopefully, you can pay your, your lifestyle, your living, uh, while being a filmmaker. And then the other thing is like, hey, I want to be able to make more stuff. I want to be able to make more films, right? Yes. Oh, man. So tell the audience, before we wrap up, where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they can they watch your work? All right. So if you go to YouTube, this is the best way. And I, I, do, I have some silly videos on there of me like making a bushcraft arrow and stuff like that. So if you're not into that, don't worry about that. Inside, there are uh, like the Moron Productions trailers. There's a little tab for that. The Moron Productions videos, I, I do have a couple of them up on YouTube right now. But uh, go to just go to YouTube, type in Michael Butt, and you should see a little logo. I think it says Moron Productions. Click on that one. Please like and subscribe. Uh, besides that, I am on Facebook. That's M-O-R-E-O-N Productions. You can find me there. And then you can find me on, uh, you can find a couple of them on Tubi and stuff like that. But which films you can go to my Tubi? website. You can you can fill, find at least Vampire Ticks from Outer Space and This Woods is Cursed. You might be able to find Yetis. I'm not sure about that one yet. I'm still working on the other ones. But uh, uh, go to www.more-onproductions.weebly.com. That's another thing I forgot to tell you about uh, filmmakers. Keep your expenses low. Like my website, I don't pay for a domain name. I just I just go through the Weebly so that I don't have a constant drain. Because if I had a constant drain, I might give up. Not saying I would, but COVID was really hard, right? So I just uh, I just don't have that drain. And it works just as well, almost as well at least. So always limit your constant drains because your constant drains will kill you. Before I let you go, what's the... You just brought something up that that I think a lot of uh, creatives go through. What stops you from giving up? What stops me from giving up? Yes, because sometimes it's like I feel this way. Sometimes I'm like, I have no idea. I <laughs> I'll, I'll give up, and then I'll be like, but I really want to make this movie, and so then I do, and then I'm like, well, this is my last one. <laughs> I'm not making another one after this. So many times. <laughs> and then you're like, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start making uh, Wisconsin Unexplained instead, and I'll, I'll interview people. And then I'll interview, and I'll get six or eight episodes, I can't remember. And then all of a sudden, everyone, no one wants to talk anymore. Uh, not because of what I, what I am or what I've been doing, but because I've just talked to everyone around me and I'd have to drive 18 miles and I'll, I'll do, a, or not 18 miles, but like 180,000 miles, whatever, a lot of miles. I'd have to drive a whole ton of miles to go to the Beast of Bray Road. And after I take, make the interview and the guy will say, oh, I don't want to be on camera. I was just telling you about it. So you can't use it. Oh man. Well, I don't have any one else lined up to film about this thing. So I can, I can get the B roll, but I need people who've actually had an experience to friggin' talk about it. And it's hard to fill a half hour of that. So then I was like, ah, I'm going to give up on that. Oh, I'll start making short films. And then I ended up making an anthology called art film out of the short films. And now I'm back into making full length features. Hey man, it, and that's it, truth. it's a double edged sword gift and a curse. I, that's not how I look at it. As like, um, as a filmmaker, as a fellow indie filmmaker, I look at it as like, man, at times I'm like, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. 
the amount of effort you put into making it a 80 90 minute feature for someone to just like be on their phone while you make it or just like ah don't really care right oh. I hated that. That's one of the reasons I gave up is because everyone's like, oh, you need 4K. We're not going to distribute it for you unless you have 4K. Well, now they gave up on that for a while, at least. And now it, you can do 1080p again, or you can upgrade it to 4K. But it was like for a while there, I couldn't distribute because everyone wanted, needed 4K films and they weren't going to touch anything else. Luckily, they calm down about that. I don't know why. I think the the reason for I was, that is I even did a I even did a Go ahead. Sorry, I even did a I even did a uh, episode of the Hex and Arcane Horror Host show. I was uh, they they invited me to go to the Windigo Fest, which uh, had its last year last year, but it, oh, that was a blast of a time going to Windigo Fest and being a guest there. But uh, they, we we did a, we did an episode of their show where I pretended I was going insane because of four Ks, and I put K K K K on the on the blackboard and stuff like that because I just kept hearing everyone like, "Oh, you need four K! Oh, you need four K!" But uh, yeah, now they've calmed down. I think the reason why they've calmed down on it is because of the cost with the infrastructure of having to support a hundred thousand films at 4k compared to 1080p. The file sizes are so vastly different that the amount of money that takes to build that infrastructure for those servers and those load balancers and the networking equipment, um, just to keep that up and running becomes, you know, sixfold or whatever the initial cost is at 1080p. Wow. I bet you're right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's essentially, if you think about it, um, if you think Amazon Prime, Netflix, Tubi in, Tubi in particular, your movie is streamed at 720p. Amazon Prime, a lot of times it's 720p or 1080p. Um, when you rent films from Amazon, the Ultra HD, like you have to, you're renting the 1080p, unless it's an original from Netflix or Amazon, that's the only time that film is in 4K. Yeah. What? Yeah. And I don't, and I, I can't stream 4K. My internet isn't good enough. Yeah. So I don't know about other people's. No, most people, most, I can. people most people can't. Even when you watch YouTube videos, it's at like 480, 720p, and people enjoy it just the same. But hey, Michael Butt, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. This is the Hyper 2 Podcast, and we're out, brother.